On a warm spring day, a fox cub comes out to play. It's on a mission, wide-eyed and bushy-tailed. Cunning, curious, or just plain cute? Alert, adept, most certainly astute. Listen up, my foxy friend, because it's time for Spring Watch. Hello. Hello and welcome to Spring Watch. It's the final programme of week one and you join us on a lovely sunny evening down here live at RSPB Arn. What a sensational spot. And of course, we'll be back next week and the week after too, entertaining you with our festival of wildlife. And we've made a good start. This is what we've had already this week, hatching ospreys. Only the second time for 200 years in the south of England. There's been a bit of predation as well, of course. The jays have had away some missile threats thrushes and some wrens, and we've thrown in some cannibalism too. Why wouldn't we? It's Spring Watch. The Kestrels eating their own young, and we've topped it off with some bejeweled reptiles and a wacky oyster catcher nest. Not three, but six eggs there, and we'll be following that tonight and through the west of next week to see if they all hatch. I think we've set the bar high, we really have. There's been so much action and there was so much drama yesterday that Chris, a few people on Twitter said it was a little bit brutal. They were a little bit shocked by Softies. the amount Softies. of drama. So we thought we'd start off with something a bit humorous. So I'll give you this. This is our oyster catcher, our trusty oyster catcher on its nest. Little Canada goose, I say little, an enormous Canada goose walks past Looks a bit snooty. But I'll tell you, the oyster catcher is gonna get the last laugh. It's taking no notice of the Canada goose. Hunting a bit, it's a little bit warm out there, but watch this, it goes down the bank, wait for it. Whoops! <laughs> what a fool, eh? What a fool! There you go, gave you a little bit of a giggle at the start of the Could show. Could happened to a finer <laughs> bird, the Canada goose slipping up there. Now, one of the reasons that we've come to Arne is the great breadth of habitats that we've got here, meaning, of course, that we have a broader range of species, and this is a very biodiverse area. We're on the southern side of Pool Harbour, which means that there's an enormous expanse of very rich mud out there. It's shallow, full of invertebrates, which sustain a population of waders and wildfowl, thousands of them in the winter, but plenty stay to breed as well. Notably, these dandy birds, the shell ducks, very brightly coloured, it's lovely to see those out there. But these waters are full of fish too, meaning there's plenty to go round. Egrets, gulls and those wading birds have them as well, of course. So it's a top place to be when it comes to seeing all of this wildlife. It's not just about the rich, sandy lowland heath and the ancient woodland at all. It's about that freshwater, seawater and all of this acid grassland that we've got here as well. And we are actually exploring Pool Harbour because we sent Megan on a mission. We've sent her out into the water on a boat to see if she can spot the two icons of the sky. And look, get my binoculars, I could probably wave at her. There she is. You can see the, the boat. Trees. And if I look through my binocs, I can say, hello, Megs. <laughs> Hello! I can nearly see you over there on the hill. Now, of course, I've made my way onto the water in Wareham Channel, which is just past Pool Harbour, and I've got my eyes firmly fixed up here because I'm on the lookout for two very special species, white-tailed eagles and, of course, the ospreys. Now, last night I said we'd try and get them to you live. Have we managed it? Well, I don't want to be too confident but I am certainly very hopeful, so you'll have to wait and see for that. And of course, the success of both these species is all about collaboration, teams working together, which has seen their numbers increase in the area, which is utterly fantastic. I'm so excited to show you what we've got coming up, and I know Gillian also has a lot to celebrate. I certainly do, celebrating the weather, and I must say first, Kroiso i Gumri. Welcome to Wales. I am still working on my Welsh, bear with me, but absolutely loving these Welsh mountain views in this glorious sunshine. We are up here to see a very special creature, one individual, a pine marten, and this very individual here is nothing less than a symbol for hope for the future of the forests and the woodlands of North Wales. And if I haven't sold this to you, Chris and Michaela, I don't know what will work because I'm 
super excited to be here to tell its story. I think she has excited I'm in. I, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm in. bought right into yeah. that. Pine Martins are sensational indeed. Now, you know how this programme works in the main. We have our small, unobtrusive cameras, tiny pieces of technology that we can put almost anywhere to observe the wildlife. We typically put them into nests, sometimes onto carcasses, sometimes some pretty unusual places. We've actually put one here underneath a piece of rusty tin. We can go live to that now. Now, why would we put one of our cameras under a piece of rusty tin. Well, because the rusty tin attracts the reptiles that live here. We have all six species of reptile, so we were hoping that something might slither or crawl under there. And last night, while we were live on air, it did, and it was the one we really wanted. Look at this. Britain's rarest reptile, the smooth snake. Fantastic, absolutely fantastic. It was a real shot in the dark to think that we might get anything under this tin, let alone a smooth snake. Now, we've got three species in the UK, the grass snake and the adder. This species is restricted to these sandy lowland heaths. You find them in Surrey and Hampshire, down here in Dorset as well. Uh, they're very shy. You don't typically see them out and about basking. And this one has come under the tin during the evening because it's found somewhere warm where it would probably overnight absolutely brilliant but we have been fortunate whilst we've been out and about to see these snakes here is one now it looks a bit different this one looks a bit dowdy that's because it's just about to shed its skin you can see it's got its milky eye there but look at the scales notably they don't have a keel running down their spine grass snakes and adders do and it's this that gives it its name smooth snake the males and the females look alike. They can both grow to about 60, maximum 80 centimetres. They're a constricting non-venomous species and they feed principally on other reptiles. Common lizards, maybe sand lizards if they're a larger one, slow worms, occasionally baby adders and grass snakes too, although they'll take the occasional vole if one pops up. Brilliant animals, we hope to see more of them, but that was a treat. Coming into our tin last night live. Britain's rarest reptile on our live cameras. That's a first for us. But let's have a look at our other star characters of the series, the ones sitting on the nests. There they all are, you can see. Oh, it's not facing the right way tonight. Every night we've gone to those cameras. The oyster catcher has been facing us, but not tonight. So I'm going to leave it. I'm going to go to the Dartford Warbler instead. Fantastic nest this, right in the middle of that gorse bush. And as we zoom in, you can see the little chicks just about poking out. Look at those feathers. That's extraordinary the way they're sticking up. Those are the chicks. What about the adults? These are the adult Dartford warblers, both of them diligently feeding those chicks. And look at that, look at the eye. This is a very distinctive bird and a specialist in this area. And as I say, there's three little heads popping up. All sorts of food going in there, caterpillars, invertebrates, spiders. And as they come in, look at this. Which mouth shall I put it in? I'll try and shove it in that one. I've seen you eat like that, Chris. Oh, don't be yeah, yeah, go on, go on. Down it goes, down it goes. <laughs> its eyes do big for its belly. As I say, both of them are doing a lot of the feeding and they're feeding so well, five to eight feeds an hour, which is an average of 6.25 feeds, which is really good. So, I mean, that is a great nest and fingers crossed it's going to continue to be successful. Fingers crossed, indeed, although I did say earlier in the week not one of my favourite birds, gave them a one out of ten. I don't know why they're gorgeous. I thought you'd like a dart. Well, when I was a kid, I was massively into them. I remember watching Blue Peter in the 1960s and they featured Dartford warblers as one of our rarest birds. And encouraged by my teacher, Miss Maundrell, I wrote to Blue Peter saying, where did you film them? Can I go and see them? And I got a typed reply from a lady called Biddy Baxter, who was the <laughs> producer of the programme, saying, no. We're not going to tell you because they're so rare. We don't want snotty young boys like you going off to disturb them. She, that... didn't, she didn't actually say that. <laughs> no, I'm that sure was the she general didn't. Gist. Anyway, it was years later that I get, got to see a Dartford warbler. No thanks to Blue Peter. No grudge, though. No grudge. No Great grudge program. At all. Val, you know, lovely lady. Now, uh, we've got another nest out there we can go to live now, which are Blackbird. It's in a root bowl, a fallen tree, and it's built amongst the exposed roots there. Adults are not in attendance at the moment there. 
but we've been watching them throughout the course of the day, of course. Both parents in attendance here, male and the female, coming in. And they've been feeding those young on a diet of all sorts of things, but plenty of worms have been brought in. Now, there were four young in the nest. You might have seen four heads there. I can tell you that subsequently, unfortunately, one of them has died. We don't know why. It's still in the bottom of the nest, but the other three are still going strong. Uh, both parents have been servicing the nest, but the male a lot less than the female. He's been averaging 1.5 visits an hour, the female 2.25, an average of 1.87 between them. So that's considerably less visits than the 6.2 visits an hour that the Dartfords have been making. But look, they're bringing more prey. They're bigger birds, bigger beaks, and they're bringing in a greater volume of prey. And there you can see they're still finding some wet patches to find worms close to the surface to feed those young. So they're doing well at the moment. And of course, you can keep your eyes on all of these cameras 10 in the morning until 10 at night. They'll be on over the weekend if you want to see what's happening at the Dartford and the Blackbird's Nest. I'm going to do a little excited dance now. Yeah? Yeah, it goes a little bit like it's not that. that excited. <laughs> no, it's not that excited. You should see excited. me listening to The Clash. <laughs> because I think that Megan, out there on the boat in the water, has got something really exciting, Megs. Hello. Yes, now I am here in the Wareham Channel, as I said earlier on, and I was a little bit sceptical when I came here this afternoon because you don't know what you're going to see, especially when it comes to live animals. But check this out. Live white-tailed eagle for you, ladies and gentlemen. This is C-466, the female that we introduced you to yesterday. And she's been sat there all afternoon. Well, pretty much. But I was so excited to get a glimpse of her. And even from where I am on the boat, I can see her with my naked eye. Just goes to show how big she is, considering she's over 300 metres away. But look at that. Isn't she spectacular? Now, within half an hour of arriving here, we saw some action, the only action we've seen from her this afternoon. So she took off from that spit and she was immediately mobbed by gulls. Now she's heading over to an island that's full of gulls and there was a survey done in May, there's about 278 Mediterranean gulls, about 3,500 black-headed gulls as well. And you can see her there in a cloud of gulls. No situation that any eagle wants to be in, but one she finds herself in because she's looking for a reward. Look, she lands down there, she gets a bit pestered by the gulls again, decides to fly up, but give it another go and look in her talons really quickly. You've got to be really eagle-eyed to see this. But we think she managed to grab a very young chick. Really hard to see because the chick is probably incredibly small. And as she flies off, she's chased away by those gulls. And of course, the gulls are very protected of their chicks. They don't want an eagle coming in to snatch them. They've worked really hard to produce those chicks, but if a white-tailed eagle gets its eyes on one, well, I'm afraid there's not that much that you can do about it. So she flew back to her spit where she landed again. She ate her snack and we've been enjoying views of her ever since. What a magnificent bird she is. I'm so excited that we got white-tailed eagle live for you. Oh, that's made my spring watch. That really genuinely has. Now, of course, white-tailed eagles were reintroduced to the Isle of Wight, but they've certainly made their home around here. They like that spit in particular, and there's very good reason for that. This habitat is really fantastic for them. So uh, we, this is a natural harbour. It's incredibly big. It's about 36 square kilometres. And on the northern side of the shore, it's quite urban. You've got pool over there. But on the southern and western areas, including the Isle of Purbeck Peninsula, surrounding islands like uh, Brown Sea Island, it is much quieter for them. And it's much shallower as well. It's only, on average, less than about 0 0.5 metres. And it's full of fish like grey mullet and therefore full of birds. And that's exactly what these eagles are after. Obviously, an area that's full of prey is going to immediately attract more large, bigger predator birds just like this. Now, we've sent our wildlife teams out to go and have a look at them in action, flying around, and uh, we've seen some fantastic things. The reintroduction project has been incredibly successful. It's been from the Forestry England and also from the wonderful Roy Dennis Wildlife Foundation. Now, they've been able to get a keen eye into these animals' lives by monitoring them very, very closely. Now, Steve Egerton Reed is from Forestry England, and he's been studying them since they've been released here. And I'm quite envious of him. I've been watching this white-tailed eagle for the last couple of hours, but he spent over 5,000 hours 
5,000 hours watching and I'm so excited about that, very jealous of him. Uh, but he's very particularly interested in their diets and I happen to have some data that he's collected there. Now typically with their diets we're getting it from pellets and poo which isn't actually as accurate, it's a bit biased, but we're watching them with the eye like Steve has, you get some really good data. So look at this. So about 21% fish makes up a white-tailed eagle's diet. I was a bit surprised by that, I thought that was a bit low. We've got 1% crustacean, 4% mollusk, 36% birds, 26% uh, mammals, and question mark 12%, something we don't know. And I was really surprised, especially by the mollusk. Is it your typical garden snail or could it be something a little bit bigger? Well, photographers looking around and out the bay have been keeping a close eye on these birds and seeing exactly what they've been up to. And look here, Ainsley Bennett got this fantastic photograph of one taking a common cuttlefish. Look at that, absolutely gorgeous. Now, I happen to have a cuttlefish bone here. And when these cuttlefish spawn, they sadly die. That means they'll float to the surface or they'll beach themselves. And then it's easy pickings for a white-tailed eagle. But what's really interesting about Steve's data is actually how their diet changes as they get older. So for example, we've got all these bars here which indicate the years that they have been out in the wild since their re-release into this area. So one year after release, two year after release and so on. Now, the mammals is particularly interesting in yellow. So the number of mammals they eat when they first release is quite a lot, but that declines as they get older. And the number of fish in pink seems to increase. And that's largely because the birds become a lot more specialised. They've become more skilled in finding those fish and preying on them. So it's fascinating to see that change in behaviour over time. Now, we do have a white-tailed eagle live. I mean, let's go to it one last time to see her. G466, what a beautiful, beautiful bird she is. I'm so pleased we managed to bring her live to you all. It's made my day. I hope it's made yours too. Very, very exciting. Now, I've been absolutely loving that. And I'm sure, Gillian, I bet you wish these were on your garden list over in Cornwall. <laughs> That would be quite the sight to see that in the garden, absolutely. But of course, I'm not in Cornwall, I'm here in North Wales. We're back up in the mountains and we're continuing our tour of North Wales. Tonight, we're in a whole new location. Last night, we were at a place called Gwaith Powder. It's a little bit south from here and we've headed up north, headed back up into the hills to a location near Vachwen. And we're keeping this location, the precise location, secret. Now, why all the mystery? Well, all will be revealed later, but we're up here, this is raptor country, and we're here to learn a little bit more about a species that we now take for granted, but it hasn't always been smooth sailing for the common buzzard. Now, the site up here has become a place where, for the last 10 years, a remote hillside spot for a pair of buzzards. Now, the one we're looking at here is a young male, he's a newcomer, and he's benefiting from food that's been left out by the land odour. So this has become a little bit of a feeding station. And it's really useful for this male because this terrain isn't the easiest hunting terrain for a buzzard, particularly what we think is a young male. Now buzzards have had a really troubled past for since the early 18, 1900s, just a thousand estimated pairs in the whole country. Persecution, pesticides meant numbers have been going up and down for most of the last century, but between 1995 and 2020, the UK breeding pairs have increased by a whopping 95%. And it's now believed there are up to 79,000 pairs in the whole country. So they have made a remarkable comeback and they've done that primarily all by themselves. There haven't been any translocations. So this is all down to natural spread. So essentially they've gone from zero to almost everywhere, which is absolutely fantastic. Now, let's just take a look because this is the actual feeding site that we saw in those, in that, those footage there. Behind me is the hide where our wildlife camera operator was filming from, Steve. And you can see it's tucked away, it's beautiful. It's also getting that evening light, so lovely backlit shots from there. I'm standing on the actual feeding station, I think you could call it. And over here is the perch. This is where you saw that young male perch cleaning off his talons before he took off. Now, I had the absolute pleasure earlier today to meet the retired uh, farm manager, the landowner here, Richard Fuller, and it was an absolute pleasure to hear him and meet him and find out more about the story of this site.
You see buzzards circling around, don't you? And a lot of people see them circling. But when you get in and close, you just realise really what beautiful birds they are. They are stunning. Yeah, and they're um, all marked differently. Each individual is different. Yeah. So we can track, you know, where what comes and what doesn't. The, the one family, the one pair, have been coming for probably eight years now. And, each, and they don't bring chicks off every year. They, they missed the year before last. I don't know, bad weather or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm always so thrilled to see the young ones come each, each year. And uh, no, they're just part of the family. It's part of, uh, you know, our extended garden, really. So you've got this opportunity to get to know this buzzard family over a decade. Yep. How do you feel about the future of buzzards, not just here in, in this one location, but generally? Well, I think they are extremely numerous, as everybody knows now, and uh, I think the, the future looks very good for them, really. When I was brought up here, you know, in the 50s, North Wales was one of the strongholds for the, for the species, and now it's spread, you know, all over. Absolutely. So yeah. there's evidence that the population here helped the spread right across the country. Yeah, I think yeah. so, yeah. 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 That's fantastic, and yeah. you played a part in that. Well, I don't know, yeah. <laughs> well, I've, I've kept them going. This habitat isn't actually ideal for buzzards. Mm -hmm. There isn't a lot of feeding opportunity here. Mm -hmm. You know, they're more like open farmland and woodland, and so but this is pretty rough hillside. Yeah. So I, I feel that helping to bring the chicks on each year has helped quite a bit really in their survival. Absolutely incredible to, yeah. to have that opportunity to see them. Yeah, it course, is. It's it? been a great pleasure, to be honest, and I hope, you know, to keep it going. That was just fantastic to meet Richard. And I have to say, those shots of the buzzers you saw right through it were his own photos that he's taken here at the feeding station. Now, of course, we've made use of it. And last night, the camera operator was able to film these shots in the last of the evening light. And I just have to remind you that 30 years ago, buzzers were still a pretty uncommon sight around the country. I know we see them quite often around the country soaring, but to see these lovely close-up shots, you really get to appreciate what magnificent birds these really are. And it's really great to hear about this positive comeback story. Now, of course, you can catch up with our buzzards and nest cameras down in on, and you can do that by going to the website or even catching up on iPlayer as well. So from a lovely, slow, steady relationship with buzzards built up over 10 years, we're going to a slightly faster paced investigation with Nadine Pereira about amazing adaptations in the natural world. Ever since I was a young boy, I've been driven to question our natural world and interrogate its genius. Nature has some incredible adaptations that at times are hard to believe. But now, with the help of science, let's see if we can explain the unexplainable. And first on my list, how do pond skaters walk on water? Walking on water, not something us lowly human beings could ever hope to achieve, at least not today. But how about our humble pond skater? There are 10 different species of pond skaters in the UK that have evolved the ability to walk on water. They're predatory insects who use the surface of the water to sense their prey, detecting vibrations. But how does it defy logic so spectacularly? To explain this, I've called on local physicist, Dr. Chris Bell. How are you doing? Hi, Nadine. I'm good, thank you. Nice good, to meet you. Good, good. I see you've come prepared today. Yeah, absolutely. So this is a, a native pond skater that we've got here. So the key thing is surface tension. The surface tension comes about because of the molecules of the water. They want to hold each other together. So they're kind of being pulled down by the molecules below. And so that creates this skin. It's like an elastic membrane and it's a small weight of this insect. When it presses down, the water wants to push back and, and that pushback supports the weight. And in order to move, yeah, you need to push against something. This row are going past, for example, the blades are going into the water and pushing the water away, and then the water pushes back, and that's what propels the boat along. Very nice. So the pond skater is doing exactly the same thing with these hairy legs with the water repellent surface, and it dips these hairs into the water Researchers have even been able to image the, the waves and even little vortices that come off the legs of this insect as it's rowing, and it looks just like the boat. Wow. 
One down, two to go. Next on my list, and maybe a little more confounding, why don't woodpeckers get concussion? The woodland drummer. Hearing that is a sure sign of spring. It's a sign of warmer days to come. Oh, brilliant. Brilliant. Whether digging for food, constructing a nest or attracting a mate, woodpeckers bang their bill on a tree in short, repeated series up to 20 times per second. Now, despite smacking trees with an acceleration three times greater than the human concussion threshold, woodpeckers can shrug off blows that would give us a serious injury. Now, this is all very impressive, but what's actually going on? Where's a physicist when you need one? Hi, Nazi. Fancy meeting you. Uh, yeah, good to see you again. <laughs> good yeah. to see you too, bro. What's really going on with our woodpecker headbangers? Yeah, so this is a really interesting example of, of how the science can change and our understanding develops over time. So the original idea that researchers used to think about was that the skull of the woodpecker was a little bit soft and acted a bit like a sponge. Yes? Right. But as recently as last year, some other researchers thought that there might be some other contributions. It's the size of the woodpecker's head which is really the important point. Uh -huh. So this is our, our human skull. OK, I recognise this. So if you want to this. grab that one, yeah. Yeah, looks a bit like me. And this is the skull of a greater spotted woodpecker. Aha. Uh -huh. OK. Wonderful. The woodpecker is hundreds of times smaller than the human skull, yes, yeah? Yes, definitely. The acceleration multiplied by the mass gives us the force. Right. So just because this thing is much, much smaller, the force it will experience is smaller. OK. Less is more. Exactly. And this alternative theory doesn't stop at size. What matters for impact injury is how much area the force is being applied to. Brains are broadly semicircular, with the human brain sitting horizontally, focusing any impact on a small area. But the woodpecker's brain is orientated to the back, so the force is distributed over a larger area of the brain. And since the brain is packed so much more tightly to their skull, they can prevent concussion. Now, saving the most extreme for last. How do squirrels survive falling from great heights? There's a theory that squirrels can fall from any height and survive. So what is going on here? Is that a physicist I see up there? Hello, mate. Dr Chris to the rescue. Should, should I be scared, Chris? You're approaching Don't worry, me Nadim, it's fine. It's with fine. a brick in your hand. Yeah, it's all <laughs> safe. We're good. This is our squirrel today. OK. Yeah. So as the squirrel is falling, it's got some velocity going down and it's yeah. accelerating. But there's another force in the problem, and this is really important. It's the air resistance, the drag force. OK. Yeah. Yeah. So the drag force is acting in the opposite direction and it's caused by all the air particles hitting the squirrel. Right. So the squirrel, if it curled into a ball, will have less drag than what they usually do, which is spread this. Right, out. exactly. So you know Got that on. the squirrel is trying to maximise its area Got exactly you. to increase that drag force. Cool. The faster the velocity, the bigger the drag speed. Right. right. So at the top, as it starts to fall, there's not much air resistance. And then as it accelerates, gets faster and faster, this drag force gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And then at a certain moment, the drag force upwards perfectly balances the gravity force downwards. Right. No more acceleration. We've reached what's called the terminal velocity. So it doesn't matter uh, at that point how much further you've got to fall, the velocity is going to stay the same. Wow. So when they land on the ground, the, the speed is not that high that they hurt themselves. All species have their own terminal velocity, but with estimates suggesting that the squirrels is around 23 miles per hour, in theory, they will never fall so hard that it is fatal. Nature's genius. The beauty of ever-evolving technology and new research means we're constantly refining our understanding of it as we rewrite nature's rule book. But one thing is certain. Nature truly is extraordinary. Now, Nadeem, that's all very fascinating, but, of course, what we all really want to know is why, when you drop toast, it always lands marmalade, uh, is it marmalade <laughs> side down. And if you put marmalade on a squirrel and then drop it, which side does it land on? 
<laughs> you tried that theory out once, didn't you? 1989, really wild show. You jumped out of a plane trying to be a peregrine falcon. I, I reached human terminal velocity, yeah. <laughs> You've never been the same and since. And when the parachute was deployed, I nearly reached a new high, <laughs> human pitch, high pitch voice falsetto. And, and you didn't have marmalade on you either. No, I had some bruises <laughs> that I'm probably still carrying. <laughs> Fantastic stuff. OK, now, yesterday we were showing you a fox family that Jess McCaffrey had found up near her home in Scotland. And there were five youngsters and the adult. We can rejoin those now for an update. So this was way back in May, and you can see that these youngsters, they're about five weeks old, five or six weeks old at this stage, spending time out of their den, weigh about a kilogram, and their teeth might just be growing through, because within the next couple of weeks, they're going to be going on to solid food. They're going to be weaned off of their mother's milk. But aside from the stats, well, they just look gorgeous, don't they? They are absolutely adorable. And, and she's got these on her trail cams. These are amazing pictures. And you can see they're romping. I like that word, romping. Jumping on each other, practising. Look at that. That's what you call a downward fox. Did you know that? That's a bit like a yoga move. I like it. They've all got their character zone. This one seems to like to be more on its own than the others. Oh, I mean, look, you can't help but look at that and have a smile on your face. As I say, they're you were going to say playing. I was going to say playing. They're practising their life skills. They're practising. Look at that. Yeah, getting it Jumping on each other, practising a pounce. And this one appears to be pouncing on an insect. It's aiming low to start with, but of course, at some stage in the future, it's going to be using a similar technique to pounce onto a vole. And here, looks a bit of dominance going on. We see this in canids. You know, the head going over the top of the other animal is indicating that it's the, it's the dominant animal. Oh, look at that. She's looking well, isn't she? Yeah. She's got a lot of young. They're all looking well. She's obviously feeding them very well. She's got a little milk. And an amazing shot. And you can see they're getting bigger, they're getting stronger, and they're still bouncing. Sensational stuff. And we're going to be following the fortunes of this fox family throughout the next couple of weeks as they grow. So more of Jess's foxes to come next week. Aren't they beautiful? And that was so oh, delightful. So you see, we could give you drama, but we can give you calm and cute as well. And you know what it's like. I mean, calm and cute and adorable certainly grabs your attention, but it's the little stuff that grabs your imagination. And so our resident botanist, Leif Sweden, has gone out to open our eyes to the beauty of the daisy. Daisies are one of our most recognisable wildflowers. The Saxons called them the day's eye because of their tendency to close up overnight. And over the centuries, day's eye has just morphed into daisy. But a daisy flower isn't a typical flower though. It's actually a collection of many tiny flowers called an inflorescence. The white petals that you pick off while playing They Love Me, They Love Me Not all belong to individual flowers around the edge. But look closely at the center and you'll notice that the yellow dome is actually made up of loads and loads of little flowers, each of which, once open, have five tiny golden petals. So we've got two different types of flower here, yellow and white, but daisies get even cooler. Because if you look at that yellow dome of flower buds in the middle, you'll notice that there's this pattern there, this kind of swirl of spirals emanating from the center. Now, the number of these spirals is significant and fits a mathematical pattern called a Fibonacci sequence that crops up all over nature. Now, a group of scientists found that if you change the angle between those spirals by even just a tiny bit, then you can't fit nearly as many flowers onto the flower head. So basically, over time, the daisy has simply maximised the number of flowers that it can fit onto its flower head, and therefore the number of offspring that it can produce. How amazing is that? Oh, how beautiful is that? Beautiful daisies, my favourite flower, actually. But we learn so much about the things that we walk past every single day. Absolutely gorgeous. Now, whilst that film was just playing out, our eagle has just taken off into the sunset, heading in, I'm assuming, to roost up in the tree line. Look, there she goes, G466, flying magnificently over the water, chased off by a few gulls because, well, you know, that's what gulls do and off she goes into the sunset, 
did her job perfectly, showed us her very best. Now we've seen white-tailed eagles, but what about goshawks? Well, we've already seen our nest camera. Let's go and take a look at our, our ospreys, of course. What about we go and take a look at our ospreys? Of course. Right, here we are. We've got both male and female CJ7 and 022 on the nest. And I'm assuming it might be CJ7 who's lying down and um, probably two beautiful chicks nestled warmly under there. But they've been doing incredibly well. Look there. You can see CJ7 uh, line there. Beautiful birds. And their chicks have been going really well. They've been feeding them absolutely brilliantly. But we sent our wildlife cameras off because we wanted to know what they were doing away from the nest. How were they hunting? And we got some really fantastic footage. Now here, this is 022. And this footage was captured about an hour ago whilst we were on the boat. It's the first time I've seen 022, the male. And he was really displaying some interesting behavior. We thought he was going to go into the water to hunt, but he kept stooping down and rising back up again. He kept tantalizing us. He kept teasing us. He's like, am I going to do it? No, I'm not. Am I going to do it? No, I'm not. <laughs> so, you know, it was really great, but I'm really pleased that we saw 022. But as I said, our wildlife team has been out there to see them hunting in action. And we have got this footage of them really getting into it. So we can assume this again is potentially 022. It's typically the male that goes out and does most of the hunting, whilst the female looks after the very little chicks in the nest. And you can see him, he's got his eye into something there. He stoops down, he kind of reassesses a little bit, checks out where the fish is that he's after. Osprey will feed solely on fish before he decides now's the time to swoop on in and get it. Now that fish looks rather big. An osprey can weigh about two kilograms and they can catch pr uh, fish up to that size. But I mean, that is quite extraordinary. Typically you're thinking about 300 grams would be good. And he's been really successful with those chicks. He's been providing for them really, really well. But of course, it's not just this year's chicks we've got to talk about because last year was incredibly historic. They managed to rear two chicks and it was fantastic to see them grow. Here you can see those two chicks in the foreground and the adult at the back. And here the chicks are a little bit older, stretching their wings, doing a little bit of what I call, well, stretching and semi-fledging. It was so exciting to see them grow the first chicks in the south of England in over 200 years. And they were called VH1 and VH2. Now this is one of those chicks right at the front there, semi-fledging, this one left, but one chick stayed behind, was still being provisioned by the adult and um, semi-fledged a little bit later on. And then, well, we said in last night's episode that we really hope one of those ospreys is down in Africa at the minute before in hopefully a year or two will make its way back up here to the south coast of England. What happened to that other chick from last year? Well, unfortunately, it came to a little bit of a sad end because when uh, an osprey chick gets to be that kind of size, you think it might be out of danger, but that very much depends on the threat that it faces. Now, if you look on the left-hand side at the back, that is a young female goshawk. And the adult there comes through trying to push it off the nest. The chick is still nestled within there. And the adult tries desperately to get rid of the goshawk, knowing what a potential threat it could be. One more swoop by and the goshawk decides to leave. The chick then comes back out feeling a little bit more confident. But the goshawk comes and takes VH2. Let's go back and have a look at that again. It happens really quickly. The goshawk comes in from the left hand side, grabs the chick. Oh, it breaks my heart. And off we go. Now, very sadly, it was really gutting to watch when that happened last year. Uh, and when the goshawk took the osprey chick down to the ground, the goshawk then left the chick. And the wonderful team at Birds of Paul Harbour did what they could. They went in to see if they could save the chick and take it to the vets. But sadly, that chick could not be saved. But VH1 did make its way down to Africa. And we're hoping to see them return very, very shortly in the next year or two. Now, of course, any parents watching know it's sometimes hard to be a parent. CJ7 and 022 certainly know that for themselves as well. But it's no different either if you're a bee fly. As the sun reaches its peak in the sky, blooms and blossoms buzz with activity. 
A late spring has shifted schedules and bees of all kinds tuck into the nectar and pollen buffet. It's a banquet for bees, but one guest is not quite what they see. The dark-edged bee fly. Now this may look like a bumblebee, but where a bee has two pairs of wings, it has just one. Their single pair is backed up by an ingenious mechanism. Little stumps called halters that act as stabilizers. They help it to precisely hover, while a long, extendable proboscis is used to reach nectar deep inside the flowers. As a fly, this female carries minimal self-defence. But being furry, buzzy and yellow-tinted, she makes even the sharpest of predators hesitate. A usually fearsome crab spider errs on the side of caution. For both males and females, sustenance derived from nectar is crucial for what the season has in store. Males hover in anticipation in the hope of catching a female on her way out of the meadow. Once paired up, they mate. And that's the male's role complete. The female's interest doesn't last much longer, but she does have arrangements to make. Her fertilised eggs need a safe place to develop. And with so many solitary bees in the meadow, there are plenty of ready-made nest holes, with more attentive mothers than she plans to be. She's looking for a particular target, an Andrena mining bee. This one's working hard to pile its nest high with pollen for when its eggs hatch. She'll make many trips to the flowers to fetch supplies, so our bee fly only has to be patient. The mining bee finally leaves the nest, opening a short window of opportunity for our furry intruder. She lands on some nearby sand and begins to dance. And it's not just any dance, she's twerking. And of course, it has a crucial function. The wiggling motion covers her eggs with sand, increasing their weight in preparation for the next stage. She moves in, hovering at the entrance of the mining bee's nest hole, a rear end laden with heavy eggs, which, one by one, she flings into the mining bee's ready-made nest. Many eggs miss the target, but the numbers game is on the bee fly's side. When her eggs hatch, they'll have plenty of pollen to eat, and they'll even eventually consume the mining bee's young. And the bee fly will have secured the next generation with relatively little effort. That is amazing, but from bee flies in the sunshine, we are in a dark, hidden, secret location near Vachuen. And just outside there, outside of where I'm standing, you'll see our camera operator, Steve. He's our wildlife camera operator, and he's got his camera trained on an enclosure. I'm keeping my voice down because we have a pine martin in there. Now, this particular individual just 
get unhidden there. She, she might come back out in a minute. But we have seen her around a lot, has been getting ready. Now, this is a pie marten, and there's so much hope resting on this particular individual. Absolutely gorgeous. The whole future of the species in this forest rests on this one individual. So quite a lot of pressure on her, definitely. Now, pie martens are absolutely amazing animals. They're agile, they're fierce, they're tenacious, they're clever, the list goes on. But we're once widespread around the whole of the UK, but habitat loss and persecution means that their numbers have absolutely been pushed to the brink. Now, they have a few strongholds in the north of the UK, particularly in Scotland, and more recently, a few pockets of resurgence, if you like, around the rest of the country. Now, this particular pine marten is called Bella. She's a female. She's got a very distinctive orange splodge there on her bib. Um, that's quite unusual. We've not seen something like that before here. And Bella is a one-year-old female and so it means she's not ready to breed yet. She has been here since mid-February. She was captive bred, but she is still very much wild in her nature, very much a wild animal. And that's a really good thing because she's destined to be released. Now, pine martens will start to breed, so Bella is likely to start to breed when she's about two to three years old. Now, we do know that there is a breeding pair in a neighboring territory about six miles away from here and they were released in 2020 along with a few other pine martens and this was part of a project called Magic Mammals Project run by Dr. Craig Shuttleworth at Bangor University and the hope is that when Bella is released her presence here will start to help to recruit some of the offspring from the neighboring territory into this territory into this area here and that will help to slowly spread the pine martin population in this area it's absolutely Absolutely wonderful to see these shots to see Bella here and like I said this is going to help with the Welsh population and also help to spread these beautiful animals here now the name Bella actually means pine martin in Welsh and certainly the names around this area of Wales and North Wales places like Bris Bris Bella, Plas Bella, all these places suggest that these forests here are very much pine marten territory. So this is the sort of area that Bella will be spreading into and along with those other captive bred pine martens. So absolutely amazing to see. And I'll tell you what I find really extraordinary as well is that Bella is going to be released very soon. We're hoping that Steve will be there to capture her first tentative steps into the wild. And it's very likely that once she heads off into the wild, that will be the last time she's seen with human eyes, maybe caught on the occasional trail camera, but certainly we will be wishing her well and hoping so much. Now, my heart is actually beating. I'm so excited about this project. Obviously, I'm trying to keep my voice down, but Chris and Michaela, isn't that just such an amazing prospect to have pine martens in these forests in North Wales once again? It certainly is, Julian. Absolutely sensational. Absolutely sensational. And what about the programme? Live pine marten, live white-tailed eagle, smooth snake, Dartford warbler, a sandy-arse fly flicking its <laughs> eggs into a hole. That's what you pay your licence fee for. Let's check in with our live cameras, because there's one particular one I want to take you to, and it is the gold crest, the nest of the gold crest. It's a beautiful nest right in the ivy. And if we zoom in, we can see that nest. Oh, and look, the adult is there. Little, We've been watching this the last eye. few days. I know, look at the beady eye. So these are the gold crest, that's the adult bird. And it's a protected nest. It's a tiny nest made out of moss and spiders webs fits into the palm of your hand. You can't see the chicks. You don't know how many there are because it's a deep nest. But it's about six to seven days old. Male and the female are feeding those chicks. You can see them coming in with all sorts of prey. Now, it's very difficult to tell the difference between the male and the female. But it's the male that does that erects his crest, that flash of gold, and that's obviously where the name comes from, the gold crest. 
But as I say, it's just the male that does that. He's getting his close up there on the camera. Protected nest. Well, that's what we thought anyway, but I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's just warn you now because this happened just before the show. I'm sorry to tell you that Jay found the nest and predated one of the chicks. At least it was quick and it only took one chick. So far. And you never know, the others just might survive. What a shame, eh? I mean, we don't know if it's the same Jay. It could be. It's not that close to the last nest. Who knows? But, yep. One of them gone. Look, in the ecological scheme of things, right, if you've got a jay eating the wrens and a jay eating the gold crest, what you really need is something that eats the jay. Let's go live to a new nest now. This is a goshawk's nest. It's got three youngsters in it, about two weeks old. And I wasn't joking when I said that jay, uh, goshawks eat jays. They do. They'll take the adults and they particularly take the youngsters out of the nest. And we've been watching the adult at the nest here. And look very closely at this goshawk, because it's not the typical barred-breasted female that you would imagine. This one has those teardrop markings on its breast because it's a one-year-old female. This is its first summer. This was a chick last year, and it's breeding for the first time. It's making a super job of it. It's rearing all three of these youngsters. It may not have the barred chest, but it's still got the ferocious chrome yellow eye there. Now, two of the chicks are larger than the other. It could be they've hatched asynchronously. It could be also that the two larger ones are females, because even in the nest, you can see the difference between the much larger female birds. There's a massive sexual dimorphism in this species and the smaller male. But at the moment, they're being very friendly, none of the buzzard bullying that we've been watching. So it's great to see these birds here. And there is that potential that they could find the jay's nest and the whole lot could go round in a wonderful circle of life. I'll tell you what, I don't like the way those two bigger ones are looking over their sibling. That, that looks a little bit frightening to me. But it's not just that bird of prey we have in that wood. We've also found another buzzard nest. This is it live. We've only just put the camera on this one. There's only one chick. Highly unlikely they only had one chick. We don't know how many there were, but Obviously, something has taken Guess what? the other chicks. Guess what? Oh, stop Goshawks it now. don't just eat jays, they'll also eat lots of young raptors. And in the woods where I live over the last couple of years, I found beneath the goshawk's nest the rear legs of buzzard chicks. It's emptied the buzzard nest of their chicks, so that could already be happening here. And as I said earlier, you should watch these cameras over the course of the weekend. 10 till 10, there's going to be plenty of action. Jays, goshawks, buzzards could be good. But not. Uh, now, let's put the jeopardy, let's put the drama to one side and calm down for tonight's mindfulness moment.
bit of beautiful calm serenity there for all of us. Let's show you some of the pictures that you've been sending in because I like this one, Chris. This, look at this. This is a successful fledging, isn't it? It certainly is. Look at those long tail tits. There's one adult and nine chicks and that was sent in by, Will, by Lee Wilcox. What about this one? Here's a gannet plunging into the water at quite an acute angle, so it's not going deep. And here's a fish attempting to flee the gannet, which is now beneath the surface of the water. And then the final shot here that Robin took is this gannet reaching out of the water and it's not connecting with the fish. It's a never-ending story, we're never going to know. Did the fish get away or did the <laughs> gannet get it? Interesting, because normally they, they dive straight down, Indeed. don't they? And so to dive at that they angle do. like that is, is a little bit different. What about this? This is a creature that not many people get to see because it spends most of its life underground. A little mole coming out to get a bite to eat. And this is from Brett Lamper from West Sussex. And do you know what they'll do? They'll take those down, won't they? They'll have a little stash of them and they'll bite their heads. Paralyse them. And paralyse them and keep them in a little larder. You see, we think the mole is gorgeous, but actually it's got a little bit of an evil side to it. I think we should just have a, a quick look at what nests we have left. <laughs> and hopefully they will still be there on Monday when we come back. What have we got? Blackbirds. Will they survive? All those different birds of prey that we've got. Let's yeah, hope so. Fingers too crossed. Far away, are they? Nightjar. Let's go live to our nightjar. Oh, there it is. Now, we know when the eggs were laid, so we can tell you that this is not going to hatch over the course of the weekend, but you could keep watching those cameras, particularly after dark, because the infrared views are fantastic. I've got my money on this bird still being around in this nest. It's the oyster catcher. Oh, it's not facing us. I love this nest because it's just such a faithful nest, isn't it? It's just always there. I've, I think I've doomed it now, haven't I? <laughs> I really have. But hopefully, we don't, we don't know when those eggs are going to hatch, but hopefully it'll still be there on Monday with its eggs. OK, we can take a last look at our Dartford warbler's nest. It's got three young in it. You can see that they are now visible across the top of the nest. They weren't when we first showed you it just a few days ago. And we know when they were laid and we think that they could fledge Saturday, Sunday, or they might hang on to Monday. So if you've got any time on Saturday or Sunday, then keep an eye on the Dartford Warblers. You might see them hopping out of that nest. And of course, the goshawks and the two buzzard nests as well. So keep your eyes on all of those. That's it for this week. What have we got coming up next week? Well, we'll be joining Jess McCaffrey's foxes again. We'll be following those throughout the course of their development. What a scene that is to finish the week. Look at that, it's gorgeous. And I'll be looking at some surprising visitors to the UK, the wool lizard. From mountains this week to the sea next week, we're going to be diving just beneath the surface to a really special rock pooling site in the Menai Strait. What a first week! Drama, excitement, we've had life, we've had loss, we've had it all, and we're going to do it all again next week from Monday. As Chris said, you can watch the cameras from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m on our social media channels. But in the meantime, get out, take some photos, send them to us, enjoy the weekend. Hopefully the sun will stay out. We'll see you on Monday at eight o'clock. Bye bye. <clears throat> what can you do to make a difference to nature and the environment? Well, sometimes big changes come from small actions. The Open University explores simple but effective ways to make a positive impact. To get inspired, go to bbc.co.uk forward slash springwatch and follow the links to the Open University.